Well, hello. Some time ago, I thought it'd be a great idea to post a video on the 12,000 mile, 20,000 kilometer service on the RTW. Coincidentally, a friend of mine drives the mate bike to mine. and He's done it a couple times on his bike and actually five other times on other people's bikes. So I thought I'd take the opportunity to have him come up as a guest wrench while I filmed it. What we ended up with was a long video, almost a bolt-by-bolt -bolt account of how to do this service, following the manual plus a few additions. So if you're interested in watching, we've spread this out over several pieces. I've chaptered each part so it's easy to refer or to advance in a particular part that you might be interested in watching. The fellow who did the work, his name is Brad. He's a friend of mine, a former airline pilot and also former FAA technician. So he's a competent wrench, he's thoughtful and methodical on his approach to working on the bike, and he's got some really good ideas that uh, you might find helpful if you watch this. He goes by the name Box Flyer Online. You may recognize that name if you've been on some of the uh, owner's group forums of BMWs. He's posted up some great technical articles that a lot of people have found very helpful. Anyway, without further ado, here's Brad. Well, hello. I'm Box Flyer, here with Chris on the street to do a 12,000 mile, 20,000 kilometer service, one of the major services on the R1200RT wethead. This is a similar service for all of the primary mechanical components on the 2014 through 2018 R1200 series of motorcycles, with the body panels being the significant difference. With the engine warmed up, I'll start the oil drain then remove all the body panels to gain access to the air filter. Replacing all the panels except the lower engine fairing to have access to do the valve timing and clearance checks later usually takes about two hours. Additionally, the tools that I use for this service are actually the tools that I carry with me all the time when I ride on the bike. I have a small bag of open-end combination wrenches, some small screwdrivers, the correct socket for spark plugs. There are a couple of sockets that are unique to the bike. One holds the muffler clamp on, and the other one is for the quick-release axle bolt. I have a stubby wrench, a ratchet wrench that has a quarter-inch drive on one side and a three-eighths on the other, so I don't have to carry two sets of wrenches. I only carry the Torx tips and the Allen wrenches that are required to do the service. Heaven help it if we ever dented a rim, but I got a ball-peen hammer to knock a dent out of a rim. Got some markers, pliers, screwdrivers, and then um, lots of spares for uh, little things that I've learned over the years that you might need for your bike, including having a spare shear bolt for your tire pressure monitor system. What I wanted to talk about here is something that I call a shop aid or a, a work aid to do this uh, service on the bike. Whenever you take the panels off, the Tupperware off of the bike, it's invariable and it's just a problem keeping the screws in the right places. On the RT, there are four different screw lengths and two different shoulder lengths and they actually need to be in the right place to hold the plastic safely. So what I did was I printed out from some source on the internet and I'd like to give them credit if I knew who it was, but there is a full, it's a 12 page PDF that includes all of the panels that are on the bike. Each one of the, bike, each one of the panels that is represented on this work aid is on one of these sheets. I cut them to size. I cut out the labels that go with each one of them and I used 3M77 adhesive spray, sprayed it on the back of them and put it on. This is a Dollar Tree foam board. Um, it's 20 by 30 inches to start with. I ended up cutting off the corners so that it fits in my top box and I can transport them when I'm going to go someplace and do a service. But the goal of this, of these work aids, the shop aid, is to have a place to keep your screws or to unscrew where screws have been misplaced in the past. It gives you a proper inventory of your screws and it's easy to reassemble and know that you have every screw hole filled when it's time to put things back together. There's another spreadsheet that I made that's a real small uh, worksheet. This is specific to the liquid cooled wet heads, the torques that are used on almost all of the service 
um, parts of the 12,000 mile service. Uh, and I cut them up into small sections so that they go on one of the work aids. They're just glued on here and they're on a handy sheet. And this is what's going to be used all day today to put all the screws in place and take them off and put the panels back on when we're done. What we're going to do next is drain the oil and this is the very first time we're going to start removing panels and the panels will all be removed from the, t the bottom to the top. As we start taking panels off the motorcycle, organization around your shop is sometimes fraught with peril and you actually do damage. So what I've done is, uh, since everybody that I know in my age group has started riding motorcycles back in the 70s and 80s, you didn't have nice pannier systems to hold your equipment on your motorcycle, whatever you're going to carry. So we all had these straps, these elastic straps. And what I've done is I hang them from a garage door track, since almost everybody has a garage door. There's one on each side, and it keeps track with the way the motorcycle is parked in the garage. So as you take left-hand panels off the motorcycle, you come over to the left-hand rail, and you just hang things up on the hooks from this uh, spider net, and uh, keep your um, panels off the floor. Nobody steps on them, and they're left side, right side organized for your motorcycle as you... Uh, start taking panels off. These are the two different kinds of tools that most people have for removing and installing oil filters. This one works for all oil filters, all sizes, and it's only good for taking the filter off. Um, I have no idea where I got it. It's one of those things that you find in the $5.99 bin at the checkout counter at most auto parts stores. This one is in a kit. There's probably uh, five different sizes and um, they fit on and this one's what you need to use for uh, getting the torque set correctly for tightening the filter uh, when you install it. So the first thing we're going to do is drain the oil out of the sump and um, get that started so that we can this can drain for quite a while. Okay, as I pulled the drain plug out, I noted that in my hands immediately, there was no crush washer on it. So you have to inspect the bottom of the engine and sure enough, the crush washer is stuck to the bottom of the engine and uh, it's not coming out easily. You certainly didn't wanna, don't wanna stack two of these crush washers together. That'll certainly cause a leak, but now we need to be careful and somehow get that crush washer off the bottom of the engine. So I was able to get the crush washer off very easily. It just has a little bit of a lip that's formed every time you uh, tighten the drain plug down properly. It creates a little bit of a lip on the inside edge usually of the crush washer. And in this case, the inside lip wedged itself to the bottom of the engine. So you just have to keep track of your inventory. We're gonna discard this one and we'll put a brand new one on when we put it back together. So as this continues to drain out of the bottom of the crankcase, we'll pull the filter off. But one of the other little secrets that I do about the filter, it's not a secret, it's just a technique, is I get it loosened and then I drill holes in it so that it drains before it comes out all over the exhaust manifold onto the O2 sensor and everything else. So once it's loose by hand here. I do my driver drill and I have a small drill bit. I don't know. This one happens to be 3 16 of an inch and it's not critical. It's just I'm going to drill a hole in this to let the oil drain out from someplace forward of where the header is. So now we're going to continue working on the right hand side and take off the panels and work our way all the way up to get to the air filter box up by the fuel filler next. So okay, so now we're going to remove the 
um, front side fairing so that we can get to all the rest of the screws. There's a lot of screws up underneath this one. So here's the uh, quarter inch ratchet drive um, that allows you to work in the confined space up underneath the front fairings where the fender or the front wheel is in the way. You can't use your driver drill to get them out. So this little uh, tool is real handy. The tool I'm using is this little uh, quarter inch drive uh, ratchet. It's very handy for this position. Okay, so now to remove this panel, it's like the other side. It's got two protruding dimples that stick into rubber grommets someplace along here, as well as the um, dual lock. Dual lock is different than Velcro. Velcro is hook and pile. Dual lock has uh, interlocking mushroom tips on two pieces of plastic uh, tape. So you kind of pull out at the front and you find the bottom dimple. It's in a rubber grommet. There's another one someplace along the back run. Up here along the top is where the Velcro, the not Velcro, it's the dual lock is. And you have to break it loose. It snaps off all at once. And then you have to push the panel to undo the two uh, plastic hooks that are on the back. Those two plastic hooks are right here and right here, and they engage these two holes right here. So this can't be pulled straight out. You just have to push it out. And now it'll go onto the uh, spider web to hang out of the way and stay off the floor so nothing gets broken. So as soon as you get the panel loose and you discover that you've got some pins that you're gonna have to try and put back in later on, the easy way to know where to push, okay, there's a panel that I have to, uh, little one of the buttons that I have to push there and the other spot I'm going to push when I reinstall the panel correctly I know I need to insert this and get it mated with the rubber grommet on the back side so now this will go hang up on the spider web with all the rest of the panels for this left left side of the bike okay starting from the back where the seat is now off there are screws that hold um, several panels together all at the same time the knee panel as well as the side fuel tank and the center fuel tank fairing are all accessible now that we've got the seat removed and the lower engine shroud off. Is a uh, 17 and a half millimeter long shoulder screw and it's the reference that you also could use for putting all these back together if you don't have the shop aid is that a long shoulder screw holds two pieces of plastic together at the same time. So the gray knee cover and the side fuel tank cover, both are held down with this. That's why it has a long shoulder to hold it in position. If you use a short, a short shoulder screw here, it would smash the plastic too tight against the fastener. Or if you didn't have the right thread length, it wouldn't engage the threads and hold properly. It would be it could strip the threads out if you put too much force on it. So this is in fact the correct screw to hold two panels together right there. And when you come around to the radiator outlet over here, you don't need to separate the radiator shroud from the knee cover leave them attached. So you just have to look at the screws that hold the radiator shroud and leave them hooked on and take the knee cover panel off and leave the shroud intact with it. So I kind of like to work on the screws from the bottom to the top. It leaves the panel supported by a screw that's up at the top of the panel instead of um, having all of the force of the weight of the panel supported by a screw that's at the bottom. So the last two screws that hold this knee panel on is the 14 and a half. It's up. the one up here in the very front that's attached to the frame, not the one that's holding the radiator shroud. And it goes up, goes right in there. Okay. And now this panel is ready to come off. So you kind of have to disengage it from the outlet path of the air from the radiator fan. And up along the fuel tank, there's a series of tabs and holes that all interlock. And this thing just um, works right out and it includes the radiator shroud. It comes with it. You don't have to detach this at all. Taking the 
So we're taking the accessory power panel off and it is the screws that we just discovered are the binding head screws with no shoulders at all for these screws that hold it on. Okay, so now that we've got access to the bottom of the glove box, the speaker cover has to come off first and then you get to the glove box. There's two screws that hold the speaker cover on. And this is another good place to have this long extension tip for your driver drill. Up here on the very top is a little ear on the top of this fairing. So this little dog has to fit back in underneath this top glare shield cover when you put this back together. It can be installed with this tab laying on the top of the dust glare shield. You need to get it down underneath when it goes back together and it just fits perfectly. In the glove box, this bike does have central locking, so it has a power cable for it. You disconnect a screw on the inside of the box. And then on the front of this is a simple pin. There's a plastic pin that fits into the speaker housing. This is the pin right here. If this isn't aligned properly with that hole under the speaker cover, you can still put the screws in and this will be bent down. It will slide down right below where it's supposed to go. So pay attention when this goes back together, it's kind of fiddly. Normally, if you wanted to take this all apart, you, there's a water gasket that holds the wires in the front of the glove box. It's very difficult to get all that gasket removed with the wires all intact, pull it all the way out just to set this aside. For what we're doing right now, it doesn't have very much weight to it. You can just let it hang on the wires because what we're going to end up moving that, removing is just this panel here to get to the air filter. So this is far enough. You don't need to dis, uh, disassemble this any further. Okay, now this is the last screw, which is the top screw on the knee panel. I like to take the top screw off last if I can. And this one has all these tabs along the fuel tank, uh, the top shroud for the fuel tank. And once again, you just guide the radiator shroud off. All this stays intact um, on this, this panel. This is a 14 and a half. There's the tab at the top that has to be unlocked and when it comes apart. This is a, uh, a binding head screw, no shoulder. I'm going to examine and find out if that's really the right one for it. This has central locking on it, so I'm going to disconnect the central locking wiring. When you pull this out, check to make sure that, that uh, you see the alignment for that pin. The pin that's going to go in again. And since this one only had the central locking holding it, not the stereo wires and everything else, it comes out um, without having to be just hung from the wiring. Okay, so when we took off the left-hand storage compartment, the screw that goes down to the inside of the box was this one here that I took out. And I don't know if you can see, but it has no shoulder on it at all. The label says it's a 14.5 with a shoulder. This has no shoulder. So either it was installed wrong, somebody's worked on the bike, it's just been mistakenly added into there. It doesn't matter. We want to try and put these things back together the right way. So this goes into the screw hole over here for yet to be determined where it goes. Over the course of working on these bikes for the last two years, I've discovered quite a few occurrences where screws are either missing, they're in the wrong place, or whatever. I have purchased several complete teardowns of bike bolts and hardware on some online auction site, you know which one. And so I have this bag full of screws that are available to be put in where something is missing. So here's an extra 14.5 with a shoulder and now we've got the inventory correct for reinstalling. So this just comes out of my inventory 
And um, I have this bag with me to whenever I do a service on somebody else's bike to correct for screws that are either missing or in the wrong place. Okay, and as we work from the bottom to the top, we're all the way up at the top of the fuel cover. So we only have a couple more fasteners to go and it'll be time to see where that air filter actually lives. There's one up here at the front and this is kind of unique. This is one that fits it's the shortest screw on the whole bike. It's a tiny little screw, doesn't have very much depth because of the way that this fits in here. This is the last screw on the front of this, this panel. This is also a binding head screw, an old style. So this has these tabs that fit in straight these go straight in to this panel over here. This one goes into a brass threaded insert in the fuel tank. So whenever you have a fuel tank that has the brass inserts, you need to make sure that you put the correct screw back in so you don't puncture the fuel tank and have a fuel leak. Now the center fuel tank cover can be removed. These plastic tabs only friction latch around the fuel filler cap, which is loose now because earlier I removed a tank bag lock ring, which is not on all bikes. Finally, here is the air filter cover. <laughs> 